Good afternoon. This is the Bishop's House. I pray that you're having a great day. Uh, we wasn't here on last week, um, but we're back this week. So I pray that you're having a great week. And this won't be a long session today um, because we're going to go right into the Word of God and then we're going to dive a little bit more deeper into the Word um, because we left last week before last, we left off at Brown verse 7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold and perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Um, and so, yeah, we in First Peter chapter 1, and we acknowledge that it's just not time for us to be acknowledged or given honor and praise at this time. Now is the time for us to give honor and praise to Jesus. We won't receive our praise and honor and glory until Jesus appear. And Jesus himself will acknowledge you for the sacrifice and your labor. This is where the scriptures say to know that your labor was not in vain in the Lord. And so Jesus himself, he desires himself to say thank you for for standing firm, for, for standing sure, for enduring the, 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 the challenge it was to serve him while in a body of flesh. Uh, he understanding that we weren't able to do what he did to live in a body of flesh and sin. That's why he became the propitiation, um, the, the, the continuing acceptance through our faith unto God even though we fall short, God continues to accept us because of our faith. Not that Paul says, not that we should continue in sin, that the grace of God would abound in our life. But God understands that, that without the Holy Ghost, we have no power over this flesh. This flesh will kill you. This flesh will do what it wants to do. And this flesh will take the advantage of you without the Holy Ghost. Yes, your very own flesh will take the advantage of you and kill you and cause you to live in a eternal hellfire without the Holy Ghost. So we thank God for, for understanding his creation because we are his creation. And so he understands us better than we understand ourselves. We think we understand ourselves, but God understands us better. It is only because of the word of God that we have any knowledge to be able to understand anything about ourselves. It's the word of God that has revealed to us how we, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, wickedness, and high dark places. And so that it is a spiritual warfare that is fighting against me and is coming out of my flesh, which is associated and connected to this world, right? And so this world don't love God. My flesh don't love God, but my flesh must come under subjection because I have faith in God. Amen. So we seen here um, um, in verse eight, um, for the present time, even though we have not seen God, right? He says here in verse eight, whom having not seen, Yet love, we haven't seen Jesus, but we do love him. How do we love him? Through our faith. And whom, and whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen. Your joy is full of glory because the joy that's in you through your faith it's, it's an unspeakable joy. You can't really even put words to it. How is it that I can love a man named Jesus, a God who I've never seen? We've never seen Jesus because Jesus is God. God is Jesus. But how can I have this unspeakable joy in me that is full of his glory, and I've never even seen him. And all that comes through just your faith, just believing that he is the Son of God. The Son of God 
the only begotten of the Father, that Jesus, God, the Holy Ghost, that they are one. They are not three. They are one. And, and, and they have different responsibilities, but they are one. And we believe that our faith, our faith drives us to believe that. Amen. And so because we believe that when we find ourselves being tried, as we saw in the scriptures, that that we will be tried, that the manifold temptations would come to try us, even though we are being tried, we have a joy that's unspeakable. See, it's unspeakable because you can't explain it. You can't explain this unspeakable joy, how you can go through manifold temptations, but still praise a God you haven't seen. You, you, you go through things in your life, whether it's sicknesses, whether it's breakups, whether it's loss, um, whether it's, it's depression, whether it's anxiety, whether it's all these things that the flesh goes through. And so the flesh goes through these things, right? But you still have a joy that's in you that you can't even speak about. You can't speak about it because you really can't put no words to it. So it's an unspeakable joy. It's a joy that, that, that you can't explain. You just know that it is and that it exists. This joy exists because you find yourself going through, but you find yourself comforted. And you can't understand why you can find comfort when everybody else is 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 falling apart. Um, you can find joy in the midst of tribulation. You, you can find joy when opposition come because you are able to identify with scriptures that says when you're going through manifold and the trials of your faith to know that Jesus is near. And you believe that. Your faith forces you to believe that. And so because you believe that, then joy comes. Because you, 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 you begin to get okay. Because you say to yourself, well, I'm going through, but I'm going to trust in God. That's unspeakable. Because that's not normal. Because when you're going through and you're having trials and tribulations and, and you're having manifold temptation come against you, the normal response is to become guarded. The normal response is to to begin to try to make provision for yourself. That's the normal response when 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 problems come. You you begin to prepare. But we understand that God is in control of my problems. God is going to protect me. God is going to revenge me. God is going to fight for me. God is going to heal me. God is going to do everything concerning to about me because I belong to him. And so therefore, because you belong to him, a unspeakable joy, a presence, the glory of God begin to rest upon us, right? So you can't talk about it. You don't know why you rejoice. So he says, whom having not seen, faith causes you to believe him who you have not seen. Faith in Christ makes one a new creature, right? So now you don't think the way you used to think. Because the way you used to think, if I haven't seen you or haven't been acquainted with you or haven't met you in person, then there's nothing for us to talk about. There's no need for me to trust that you're going to show up and I don't know anything about you. But that's the old you. But the new you, which is a new creature, the new man that's in you, which is Christ Jesus, he causes you to have this joy, right? So that and all that comes through your faith because it makes you a new creature and it instills in him a personal living confidence. Not only do you believe, but you have confidence. We not only believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he was born of a virgin, that he came down through 40 and two generations, as the Bible teaches us, and that he died. And went into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And that on the third day, he rose from the grave, the dead. While in the grave, something was happening. He was accomplishing and defeating Satan while in the grave. 
There was no physical fight that went on. Where he defeated Satan was, Satan thought that, and Satan knows that, once you're dead and you're in the grave, that it is over, that there's no more work for you to accomplish. But what happened was when Jesus got up from the grave, he defeated Satan by the very thing that Satan tries and desires to do to the believing, that is kill him. So he defeats him by getting up from the grave, showing the devil that he has power over the grave, that all power belongs to him. So therefore he takes the power, the Bible says the keys, he takes the keys from Satan, the power over the fear of death, the grave. He takes that when he gets up. There wasn't a physical key that he took, but he took, it's a metaphor. He took the power that Satan had over us in death by defeating death, by getting up, by showing that he has life over everything, right? It doesn't matter what situation. It doesn't matter what you do to Christ. It doesn't matter that you killed him in the flesh. You really didn't even kill him. He said, no man take my life. I laid my own life down. And when you look at it, as they was going through the process of piercing him in his side and, and pulling his hairs from him and, and doing all these things, he wouldn't die until it was time for him to die because no man can kill the God because God cannot die. So he says, no man take my life. He said, I lay my life down. And if I lay it down, I'll pick it back up. So he allowed man to pierce him in his side. He allowed man to, to, to afflict him in his external. But man couldn't kill him. The same, reason, the same way man can't kill you. If you kill yourself, it's because you've chosen to kill yourself. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The things that you would normally do to yourself to kill yourself, God, the power of his spirit, the Holy Ghost, which is in you, is greater in you. So the greatness that's in you that comes through the Holy Ghost gives you power not to do the things unto yourself that would kill yourself, not only in this life, but in the eternal this is why greater is he that is in you. And the spirit that's in you defeats. It does the same thing that Christ did to Satan when he defeated the grave, when he defeated death. The Holy Ghost in you does the same thing now that Christ did then. He defeats the flesh that desires to go against the will of God. He kills it. This is why he says, mortify the deeds of your flesh because you have the power to kill the bad habits, the bad deeds, the bad thoughts, the bad, the bad uh, 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 appetites that you have, whether it be physical or spiritual. You have the authority to mortify, kill the deeds of your flesh. Amen. So we have confidence as strong as faith of those who have seen him. Our faith allows us to have the same confidence that they had, the apostles and those who witnessed Christ. Our faith allows us to have that same confidence of those who seen him and we don't see him. Because again, you have not seen him with your natural eyes. But the spirit that's in you witnessed it all. He walked with, with Jesus because he was Jesus. He, 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 he was there with Jesus on the cross because he is Jesus. The Holy Ghost is Jesus. The Holy Ghost is God. Amen. So him being in you gives you the same confidence. I say all the time, you physically didn't witness it, but the new man and you did witness Jesus. Amen. So this gives you confidence, the same as they had who lived with him and who operated with him and who handled him. 
And this faith, this faith that we have, it produces joy. An unspeakable joy, he says. This is what your faith does. It, it, it produces an unspeakable joy of who, excuse me, whom have they not seen yet love? We haven't seen Jesus, but we love Jesus. Verse eight. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, even though we didn't see him in the flesh, we believe he gave sight to the blind. We believe he walked the seashores of Galilee because, again, the spirit that's with us was walking the seashores of Galilee with Jesus. The spirit that's in us was giving sight to the blind when Jesus put his hand down and took the spit and put took the, 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 the dirt off the ground and wiped on his, the, the man's eyes and he began to see. The spirit that Allow Jesus to tell Lazarus to come from the grave. The woman that met Jesus with the issue of blood. And her issue was dried up and she was made whole. The man who laid at the pool of Bethesda. For 38 long years. And Jesus tell him to pick up thy bed. Rise, pick up thy bed and walk. So the spirit that's in us was there operating. And so we have witness because the spirit know those things. So the faith in us, just believing, allow us to have confidence and to believe those things again. And this brings about a unspeakable joy in us that we cannot speak about, but it just brings joy to us because the flesh is limited to what it can do. But the spirit can do things and accomplish things that the flesh cannot do. The flesh cannot believe something that it has not witnessed or seen. It's not designed to. The flesh is tangible. The flesh move on tangible things, things that it sees, things that it can connect with. But the spirit in us, which is spiritual, it it can move and it's limitless and it has the knowledge of the past and the present and the future and that spirit in us, right? This is why it, 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 be a, it becomes an unspeakable joy to us because we're limited, but the spirit in us is limitless. The spirit in us knows all things. The spirit in us, amen, allows us to feel the joy and it allows us to have the confidence. It, it assists us in having joy and in, in the joy in Jesus. It assists us in having the confidence in Jesus and knowing because again, it only can believe or know what it see. But once the spirit comes in you, the flesh can do things that it normally is not capable of doing. One, the flesh desires to sin. But once the spirit enters in through your faith, the flesh will desire less to sin. That's, that's not normal for the flesh. But when the spirit is in you, you can do all things through Christ Jesus that gives your flesh the strength. Because now, because you have confidence and faith in Jesus, you can take authority over your flesh, just like uh, 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 Paul says in Romans in that he died unto sin once but to live forever in the eternal Jesus came and died unto sin once right so now we have this unspeakable joy in us he says in, in, in Romans 8 it slips my mind but I want to read it no for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, that they are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. This is why, this is why, uh, why, why we have this joy in us, this anticipation, this, 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 this confidence, because we know that upon Jesus' return, 
that all the suffering that we've gone through in this life, that it cannot be compared to the, the glory which God is going to reveal in us. It can't be compared. So we have this confidence, amen? And it's a joy, an unspeakable joy. And so he says in verse nine, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. He talks about this end. Telos. In the Greek, T-E. Let me make sure I'm pronouncing it right. The Greek word for end. Enduring, right? To the end. Telos. In Telos is a term used by a philosopher Aristotle to refer to the final cause of a natural organ or entity or of human art. Telos is the root of the, what it says, didn't give it to me. But the philosopher Aristotle refers to Telos as the final, okay? So let's get tell us tell us i'm sorry tell us tell us t-e-l-o-s the end right so he says in verse 9 receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls right tell us but even before we go there let's just look at romans 5 and 5 Let's see what that says. I just want to look at Romans 5 and 5. Go to Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 5. What does it say? And hope, Romans 5. Yes, what is scripture? Romans 5 and 5. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So we continue to hope. We continue to have this confidence, right? Uh, let's go back to verse four. And patience. We must have patience, experience, and experience brings about hope, right? Because patience causes you, co patience comes after experience, right? You see it here. Um, patience is before experience. But once you begin to have life experiences, it develops patience, right? And so he says, and patience, experience, right? After you experience some things in your life, you gain patience. Sometimes you make a mistake in some of the experiences of your life, and then you learn from them and you gain patience, right? Patience, experience, and experience hope. Because what happens is they, 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 they work together because you experience things in your life, you grow from them, you mature from them, you gain patience because you will experience some things again in your life that you've experienced before in your life. And so it gives you a level of experience to be able to, to wait and to be able to allow certain situations to work itself out and to wait on God to deliver, right? And so once God deliver um, through your patience, it brings about hope, right? Because you hope that God will step in and deliver or, or, or handle that situation for you as he once did, right? And so in verse five, he says, and hope make him not ashamed. So you're not going to be ashamed because what happens is most of the time people will say to you, well, why are you not going to do this? Why didn't you get that response? Or, or, or you're not going to do this. You're going to just let them do that and get away with that. No, my experiences in life have taught me that I must be patient and I must wait on God, that I must have hope in God, who is the hope of glory, right? That he will work this out for me. And it's not, and I'm not going to be ashamed that I'm waiting on God and that I'm not going to put the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse because the, the, the cart must go behind the horse so that the horse can pull the cart. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to react or have this knee-jerk reaction and just do what you think I should do or do what my flesh say 
I'm should do, but I'm going to say, I'm going to hope and I'm going to wait on the Lord. And I'm not going to be ashamed of that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be ashamed to say if it's the Lord's will that this will happen or that will happen, or I'm going to do this, or I won't do that. I'm not going to be ashamed of that to give the Lord the credit that, that, or, or let the world know that I had no response because I'm waiting on the Lord. And life experiences have taught me that. It has taught me that I must be patient. And I'm not going to be ashamed of that because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts, right? By the Holy Ghost. So I'm not going to be ashamed to, to let the world know that the love of God is in me. And that's the reason why I didn't respond the way that you thought I should respond or the way that the universe says a person should respond to situations. No, I'm going to wait on God and I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm going to hope in the hope of glory that he's going to show up, work this out for me. Amen. Because his love is in my heart through the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so he says in verse nine that we're going to receive until the end of your faith. Tell us. Tell us the end, the end. Tell us the end of your faith, receiving the tell us of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Amen. So we go and we look at tell us the end. The end of a thing. It could also mean the cons the cons the consummation of being admitted or initiated into religion. It could mean the end of the old man, the old you, the telos, the end of who you used to be. Now you being you being consummated. You 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 being admitted. You being uh uh uh. Uh, not you being initiated, right? Because the old man is dying, right? You're being admitted into this new life, the new covenant that has been delivered to us, right? It says marriage, etc. Anything that 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 is coming to an end in a new beginning is beginning to start, right? The telos of your old man, the end of your old man, right? He, he no longer exists because he has died, right? Uh, go to 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians. Uh, what? 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the telos, the end. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's new. So something has to be old, right? Something has to, something have to had ended. Something had to have reached its telos, right? Because he says, old things are passed away. The old man, your old deeds, your old ways. It has reached its tell us, right? Behold, look. The word behold means to look, to see. All things are become new. There's a new creature. There's a new man. There's new ways, right? There's a new beginning to your life. And all things are of God. Everything about you should be of God. When people associate you, they should associate you with God. When people like you could have a business, your business should be associated with God. Your home, your home should be associated with God. Your vehicle, your vehicle should be associated with God. You shouldn't have a vehicle as a man and you got two big testicles hanging down in the back of it. That's indicating that you are a man and you got big cojones. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be riding around with that on the back of your car as a man. Some of the labels that we put on our car, which sometimes could be political. If you're going to put a, any type of label on your car, you should put a label that promotes the kingdom of God. He says 
All things are of God. Everything about you should be of God. If you started a new business, your business should promote the kingdom of heaven. You don't have to have a business that says uh, that, 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 that spook people away because of religion. No, you shouldn't do that. But it should be clean if you have a business. If you're promoting your business, your business should be promoted cleanly. If your lifestyle, you're promoting your lifestyle, your, your lifestyle should be promoted cleanly. The way you adorn yourself, it should be clean. If you a man, you know, now they got these new suits that the men put on. They all tight, showing all your body parts. You know, when you look at that, a lot of women look at those men in those body suits. They showing all their body figures and they are attracted to them. The, the Bible says that when Jesus came, he came. Let me find it. I don't want to keep telling you. I'm going to show it to you in the word. That no man would desire him in Isaiah. Um, Isaiah 53, go to Isaiah 53. I jumped out of, I jumped out of here, um, in second Corinthians, but go to Isaiah 53, because we're talking about, we're talking about teleos, the old man dying, right? And, and being new creatures, right? And, and, and everything that we do, Jesus Christ being the, 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 the trendsetter of the believer, Jesus Christ being the format right, of the believer, uh, uh, he says, go to Isaiah 53. If the old man has reached his teleos, the end, right, and the new man has been, has been created in him, who does the new man follow? The new man should be following after the attributes of Christ, the personality of Christ. This is why the Bible even teaches us Think it not strange to be equal. The same way Christ thought it not strange to be equal with God. That's why the Bible tells us to let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. To be like Christ. Everything that we do now, it should promote the kingdom of God. We should, we should, we should, be, we should be spiritually appealing when people see us. Our home should be spiritually appealing when people enter it. Our lifestyle should be spiritually appealing when people come in contact with it. In the workplace, it should be spiritually appealing when people interact with us. If we started a business, our business should promote the kingdom of God. So Jesus Christ in chapter 23, he says, who have believed our report. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? See, a lot of times we do things because we chase the money. We chase the dollar. So we do what everybody else do. No, no. Do what God is telling you to do. And he will multiply. He says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he have no form nor calmliness. And when we shall see him talking about Jesus, there is no beauty that we should desire him. People shouldn't desire you because of what you have on or how you look. I'm not saying you have to look bad. No. I'm not saying you have to dress yourself all like a homeless person. No, no, I'm not saying those things. But however you dress and adorn yourself, it should be appropriate that nobody would desire to have you because of what you have on. Some of the dresses that the women wear now is not appropriate for a woman of God. All these form fitting dresses. Well, I don't want to look like an old maid, but the Bible says when Jesus came, if we are, if we are fashioning ourselves after the Lord, look what Jesus did. 
He said that he had no form, no comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It is better. It is easier to live holy when people are not desiring you, because when people begin to desire you because of your flesh, you will be deceived by your flesh and you will think that you are more than who you are and what you should be in the flesh as a child of God. You will miss the focal point of your life, that your life is now a ambassador. It should look like it represent the kingdom of God, right? And now people are desiring your flesh because of what you put on your flesh. And now they desire to have your flesh and not what's in your flesh which is the hope of glory, Jesus Christ. He is despised and rejected of men. You're going to be, re you're going to be despised and rejected of men because you're not appeasing to their eyes. And that is okay. Because Jesus will provide all of your needs according to his riches and glory, right? And so no man desired his flesh. And so, and so not only our flesh, but everything that we have should be God-like. I see people, they promote their business. They, 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 they say God in one half of the business and they say a whole lot of stuff on the other half of the business. That is not God-like because they're trying to reach the world and they're trying to, and they say, well, why go into business if you're not going to try to reach the world? Trust in God. God will send you all the business that you need. Do it God's way. Do it the way that Jesus did. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Your lifestyle is a business. Keep it clean. God will send everything that you need in your life, right? But Telios, the end of the old man and his ways, right? They die. Because we are now being admitted and initiated into a new life. This is what Peter has in mind. It refers to believers being initiated into salvation by their faith. This is what he's talking about in verse 8 and 9. That, that, that Peter was saying that it is through our faith that we are being initiated, right? Because the old man, Telios, has come to an end and a new man is beginning. He could have had in mind the end of salvation itself, which is at the end of a life of faith, right? Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Verse, verse uh, nine. The end of your faith. Let's just look at. What is this? Let's look at Matthew. Ten, go to Matthew 10 and 22. Go to Matthew 10 and 22. Matthew 10, 22. This was Jesus here speaking. He says, and ye shall be hated. See, of all men for my name's sake. But the part that associates with the scripture to the end, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved, right? You, when you allow your faith in Jesus to create a new man in you and you allow the Holy Ghost to bring a teleos to the old man in you, a end. 
This is when we talk about being sanctified and sanctification, right? Sanctified is being available, a vessel that is always available for God to use when you're sanctified. Jesus Christ sanctified us through our faith. Your faith automatically believing in Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, it automatically sanctified you. But then we find ourselves in the process of sanctification as long as we live in. Because we always want to be accepted of God and we always want to be available to God because this is where God steps into. He steps into the sanctified being and he begins to work in the earth because we are available for him. We are sanctified and only Jesus can sanctify us. But he has given us the ability through the word of God and our faith to operate in the process of sanctification so that we'll remain sanctified. The process of sanctification takes place when you begin to obey the commandments of Jesus that he left in the word, not only from himself, but through the apostles. And understand this, even through the apostles, it was his word. He used them. So he says, going through that, I'm paraphrasing, but going through that process of sanctification, allowing the old man in you to remain at the end, at the teleos of his existence, you are going to be hated by man for his namesake. And then it goes back to not being ashamed of that evil, as we talked about. Not being ashamed of what you stand for and what you believe, regardless of what people think or what people feel. Wherever you go in this life, you stand on Christ Jesus and the old man remains dead. He says, but he that endureth to the end, he that continues in my commandments, he shall be saved. He that allows the old man in him to remain crucified, he shall be saved, right? So this was Jesus saying this. That was Matthew 10, 22. Let's look at Matthew 24 and 6. See what that says. Matthew 24 and 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Again, he's speaking of the end. Again, it's good to know so that you're not confused, so that you're not deceived, so that you can continue in the, the, the faith of God, knowing that the things that are going on and that are happening around you, that they must come to pass before the coming of Christ, right? So he says, and ye shall hear, and we do hear wars and rumors of wars. We hear Israel is at war right now with the Palestinians, right? See that ye, and Russia is at war with Ukraine. We, this, is, this is wars, and we hear about them, and the rumors of them, the things that are going on. See that ye be not troubled. Don't let this stuff trouble you to the point where you become paranoid. Keep serving God, Right? Don't get to a point where you, well, I, 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 the world coming to an end. I got to hurry up and do this and do that because none of this stuff you're going to take with you. Don't be troubled about that stuff for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. We'll know what the end is going to be when Jesus returned. Until Jesus returned, continue to allow the old man that was in, that was crucified, right? Through the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Allow him to remain at his end. Allow him to remain at his end, teleos, right? Until Jesus returned. Because when he returned, there's a reward that awaits you for your sacrifice. And you have, and this is the unspeakable joy that's in you 
that gives you the confidence to continue until Jesus come. Let's turn your Bibles to uh, Colossians 3. Colossians 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He tells us to set your affections on things above, not things on the earth. This is why he says set your affections on things that are above because the old man has been crucified. Right? The end has come for him. Receiving the end of your faith, right? Set your affections on things above, not things on the earth. For ye are dead. You are dead. And your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. He says, mortify therefore the members of which are, member, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication. These are the members that we have. He wasn't talking about your arms and your legs. He was talking about the members of your personality, the members of the spirits that's in you. Fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetedness. These things are idolatry, he says. This evil concupiscence, it's an unnatural affection that we have. People that just act like they have to have stuff and got going to go to any means to ha have it. That's unnatural. That's unnatural for a child of God because if it's the Lord's will should be your mindset, right? Covetedness, coveted in things that that necessarily are not for you. Everything is not for the man of God. Everything is not for him, right? He says, these things are idolatry for which sake, for which things sake, for these, for these things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. This is why you're not happy in your child of God. Because somewhere along the line, you have fallen into fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, uh, and covetedness. And these things are idolatry. Again, that's inordinate affection, unnormal. Concupiscence. Concupiscence. Strong sexual desire, lust. Somewhere along the way, you might you might not be strong sexual desire, lust. You may have a you may be in a relationship, may, might, you might be uh in a monogamous marriage, you're not cheating and doing all that. But it's some things that you lust after that you want, you just got to have. Uh you see them, they have that, you gotta have that. Uh, you see them with this. You want to do that. You see people traveling and taking pictures all around the world. You got to have that. But your bottom line and your money and your bills need to be paid. And you got to pay your tithing and give your offering to God. And you taking this money, juggling with that to do this thing so that you can get to Coco Cabana and 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 show the pictures in your bathing suit, half naked, and 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 drinking a cocktail. And you're a child of God. And 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 when Jesus Christ came, He came and showed none of that. We want to do what the world do. It looks good. People are in in uh uh what it, what what's the word I'm looking for? When you go away and it's beautiful and it's and it's peaceful. Uh, tra no, uh, look for all this tranquility. Ain't no tranquility in the world. Hey Google, what's the definition of tranquility? Here's the definition of tranquility: the quality or state of being tranquil, calm. Ain't no, ain't no, ain't no uh, calmness in this world. 
You see these beautiful pictures on the beaches and you want to go and feel the calmness of the beach. It's nothing wrong with going on vacation and laying on the beach. Nothing wrong with that. But don't work towards that. Pay your bills, pay your tithing and give your offering to God first because that belongs to him. And if you're able to do those things, then do those things. And then when you do those things, don't don't get on social media and take all these pictures and, and showing your naked body to people and, and y'all sipping and drinking cocktails and all that for a child of God. Let that be your personal. Let that be your personal vacation with you and your family. Stop doing what the world do. Everything for the world is not for the people of God. It's not. I've been guilty of going on vacation and taking pictures and showing the pictures. I've been guilty of that. You go to my social media, you see me on vacation, but ain't no vacation. That wasn't for everybody. See, the preacher have to tell on himself first. He got to tell on himself first. We're all maturing and we all growing. When I go back on vacation again, you ain't going to know. Because it's not for everybody to see my body and to see me and to see my wife's body. That ain't for everybody. That's for me and my wife. But we do what the world do and we get caught up in the things that the world do. And we say, oh, that's just gone too far. It's too much. But when Jesus came, he came that no man would even desire him. You can go on vacation and enjoy yourself and keep it clean. You can have a lifestyle that is nice, but keep it clean. You can have uh, 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 anything you want in this life, but keep it clean because that's what the Lord did. He kept it clean. I just got to tell the truth. And if I fall in, the, if I fall in the midst of the truth, I got to tell on myself. I have to. I can't be a hypocrite. So he tells us mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the face of the earth. And these things happen and then the wrath of God come. And then we find ourselves not being happy in the Lord. Amen. In the which ye also walk sometime when ye lived in them. So we're going to stop right there. So next week, you know, we're going to pick up in 1 Peter 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come on to you talk about the grace that should come unto you the grace that jesus is going to bring unto us of which salvation the prophets the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come that's jesus the grace that should come unto you searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Amen. So this is the bishop's test. I pray that the word of God have been a blessing to you. Have a great week. And if it's the Lord's will, if it's the Lord's will, I'll see you on Sunday morning. God bless you all.